Hi, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About Mental Health, the show about mental health and addictions. My name is Nels Kloster. I'm an addiction psychiatrist working in southern Vermont. And my name is Robert Stack. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, licensed mental health counselor. And uh, first of all, I want to say what a great show we had last week, uh, Mary yeah, Ellen yeah. Copeland, and it was just really went well. Yeah, that was that was very nice. I mean, and she talked about people taking charge of their own, their own mental right. health. Talked about that's sense right. of connectedness to community. I, I really enjoyed having her on the show. And, and we should have yeah. more experts on. But for tonight, yeah. it's yeah. just us. Right. And I have to say, I mean, one of the things that we uh, we wanted to talk about was spirituality. And this really makes us nervous because, you know, normally if you're going to talk about spirituality, you bring on the expert, you bring on a rabbi, a minister, a priest, yeah. or somebody. And what yeah. we're going to try and do is just talk about it in, in the context of just like laypersons. I mean, how do you understand spirituality I mean, and, and how do you use it in recovery from addiction and mental health? And so I, I think, you know, one of the things I did was I went around and I asked people, you know, tell me what your thoughts are. And, uh, one of the first things I ran across was that people really had a hard time with the words. They don't like the word right. God, or they, they, as soon as you say God, they get nervous. Or, or, you, or religion has a certain oh, set of meanings to it. Almost automatically, you'll hear some people say, well, I, I, I have a spiritual life, but not a religious life. They want to remove that. Um, and I also found sort of uh, almost a reluctance to talk about it. Now, I know you have some statistics, and it says that a lot of people believe in God. Yeah. Yeah. But it's almost, it sometimes get a sense of embarrassment almost. I mean, I'm not quite sure what that's about. I mean, it's sort of a, um, I know for me at one point in my life, I almost felt like um, to have a spiritual life or to believe in, in spirituality was to, I don't know, like it wasn't intelligent. Like it wasn't right, smart. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, like, well, like if you're smart, you can't really believe in God or you can't, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and I think that was like a major stumbling block to me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I read some place where they talked about intellectual pride. And I think that I had. So anyway, so that for, for the interest of, of the re rest of the time that we talk, I guess I would like to say that one of my ways that I understand uh, spirituality, and there's two ways that I think about it. One is that if you've ever seen somebody die, uh, one moment they're alive, they're breathing, and the next second or so, a minute, they're gone. There's nobody there. Their body is there, the face is there, the, everything is there, but there's something missing. And, and you could say that it's electricity or whatever it might be, but I think it's the life force. Yeah. And I often think of that as, as one spirit. And I, I tend to think that, you know, um, our spiritual life is not our intellectual life, and it's not our physical life. It's, it's like the third piece of it. And it has to do with our capacity to love. It has to do with our capacity of uh, our, our sense of well-being, our sense of uh, um, that you're not in this all alone. I don't know how else to say that, but I mean, I, so that's really how I tend to think about it. when I think of the spirit. I, I, you can use the word soul if you're comfortable, but as soon as you do that, I think some people get a little nervous mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. But that is how I understand it. I think it's. Uh, and you've heard me say this, but uh, it, it's, you know, if somebody said they were heartbroken, uh, they wouldn't really mean that their heart, which is a muscle, is broken. I mean, their heart, that's a heart attack. And what they really mean is that there's some pain inside that has to do with, with love, with, with connection to another person or something else that's important to them. So I, I tend to think about that. Like when I think about someone who's uh, depressed and, and really in rough shape. I mean, I tend to think someone who has no hope or no belief in something. I, I tend to think that that's spiritual. Now, I know that there's other ways of thinking about it, but that's sort of how I think about it. And I, I think as we go through this half hour talking about it, I would like people, you know, to, to suspend their disbelief, if you will, mm -hmm. or to suspend their sort of, oh, I can't believe in that stuff. And just listen to it like with an open mind. And try and think about if if it was up to you to figure out a way to use spirituality to have a better life, what would it be, and how would you do it? Yeah, and and, 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 and I mean, it has, it has an impact on, on on our wellness too, both both physically and mentally. But it really intrigued me to talk about the idea of feeling like you you were too smart to kind of have a set of beliefs like that. And I'm pretty sure it's just one of those. Um, 
kind of urban urban myths or legends, but supposedly there was a conversation with Carl Sagan and another you know well respected scientist, and I can't remember who said what, but I think it was you know Carl Sagan saying supposedly the other scientist, well you're so smart. How is it you believe in? And I guess because I was Christian, how do you believe in God? And the other guy supposedly answered back, well you're so smart. How do you not believe? And I think too that we know sort of like, like Albert Einstein, you know probably one of the most notable scientists of all times, you know, very much had a set of sort of uh, beliefs or a spirituality that he you know, often, often talked about. And sort of getting back to the more ordinary, I'm thinking back to being raised kind of Lutheran and being sent to catechism for uh, two years to, to, to learn what you're supposed to learn there. And our minister was very big on sort of the idea of, of wrestling with this. These are very important ideas, and they shouldn't just be accepted uh, blindly that you really should think about it and feel it. And what he often talked about, and I'm not sure if it's necessarily a, a Lutheran tradition, is the, the leap of faith, that you can't come to this by intellect alone. So just thinking about it, just being smart, that doesn't necessarily bring you towards any faith or any spirituality. There's something about this, like you're saying, it's a matter of the heart, it's a matter of the spirit. It's just something that's almost unfathomable, but yet it is so common that we all hold some kind of belief. And, and I think, and the other thing is, that is so striking to me, is the comfort that people find in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's like, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, I was born into a religion. And, you know, I was baptized and all the Catholicism. But it never felt like something that was mine. I mean, it was something that I was expected. You know, you go to church, you go to mass, you do yeah, that. What your neighbors did, what your family did. Yeah, right? it was yeah. a culture almost. I mean, I'm Irish Catholic, and uh, and but you know, when I went into the service as I got older, it, it had less and less meaning in my life. And as a matter of fact, it, it almost, it I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you can always talk about these things in some weird way, but it's sort of like I didn't. It wasn't part of my life. And I remember as I got older, like I met people who had developed a spiritual life. And a lot of them had found alternative spirituality, like Buddhism, mm -hmm. like they had grown up a... Uh, almost like a kind of rebellion in your spiritual well, beliefs, yeah, right? Yeah, or almost as if, you know, the traditional Judeo-Christian or Protestant, or, you know, if you study the religions in America and you realize there was the Unitarians and there were the Baptists yeah. and there were, you know... There's a whole menu out here That's of things right. I can you know, choose and you from, traced right? it back yeah. that, you know, Henry wanted to have another wife, you know what I mean? And it was a, or if you want to like look at the, because they had three popes and there was yeah, all oh, and all stuff. the children of the popes yeah, had yeah, back yeah, in the right. Middle Ages. So example. I mean, yeah. on some level, I mean, I think in a lot of you know people sort of go, well, the religion is this, and you know, there's all that other problems with it. But I think there is a universal search for that element um, that that you know people find themselves at peace with themselves. Mm -hmm. People actually ex experience a sense of self-esteem and self-love and the ability to love others. And I, I really believe this. I mean, I, I think, and you know, if you're spiritually fit, in a lot of ways, the rest of the world sort of makes sense. I right. mean, that's my, I mean, that's my. Well, I mean, how, how else? I think there's a big piece of it too. Is how else do we make sense of the the chaos, the the unfairness? that is out there in the world. If you don't have some sort of sense of something sort of beyond yourself right. or something sort of a bigger picture view of the, of, of the world. Well, that, and that's interesting because after, you know, after the Holocaust, after what happened there, you know, uh, some people say, well, God is dead or, you know, it can't mm -hmm. possibly be. Why wouldn't God intervene yeah. and everything? And, you know, and I struggle with that, like, you know, because I used to think of God as an interventionist. And I, you know, and again, I don't have the answer. It's funny, as I'm talking to you, I feel like I want to apologize. Um, because I'm talking about things that people don't normally talk about. But the idea is that, you know, I believe, and, and I, people can disagree, obviously, but I think part of the, the what man has is, is free will. And we have a choice about how we live our lives. And, and, you know, there's no value in a virtuous life unless there's a choice not to be. And I think that, that part of it is the choices that we make in the lives that we live. And I, I don't, I, I, you know, one of my challenges when I worked in the, in the hospital, sometimes when I worked with addicts, and I would recommend 12-step programs. And they would say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a, God. You know, there's some God in there, yeah. some spiritual thing. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't do God is the thing I heard the yeah, most often. Yeah, I can't often. do God, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, but there's two things there. I mean, one, I would sort of say, well, you know, 
these fellowships help people get better. And it's sort of interesting, you know, uh, you know, the nurse on the unit used to talk about addicts who had the gift of desperation. You know, mm -hmm. if you get desperate enough, you try anything. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I'll try it. And I think that's how I, I approach some folks. I sort of said, well, look, why don't you give it a try uh, before you decide that it's not helpful? Because I think that's what happens with a lot of people. I mean, especially like with prayer or meditation sometimes. They, they decide ahead of time that, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work. But they haven't done it. Right. And, and you know what I mean? It, it's sort of like, a, a, and a, you know, you sometimes have to encourage people who say, well, give it a try. See if it's helpful. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe in the power of prayer. Uh, I pray every day. I don't mind saying that. Um, and I don't think it's like that I pray for things. I don't pray for the lottery. I don't pray for, mm -hmm. you know, I, what I pray for is like the ability to live my life. And, you know, I don't mean that like it's like a, a you know, but anything it, special. But it, it doesn't need to be apologized for me. It's not yeah, even, yeah. Um, it's not even, it's not unusual, uh, you know, looking at some, you know, studies and statistics and this yeah. sort of thing. Like 95% of Americans believe in God. And 90% of people across the world practice some kind of, of religious or spiritual uh, observance. And so you can even see it goes way back in history with like Neanderthals sort of 50, 60,000 years ago. And even some evidence goes even farther back, like hundreds of thousands of years ago, that there was evidence that there were sort of spiritual or religious practices around burials. So, you know, finding a grave that had objects in it, which was suggestive of a belief that they would take those to an afterlife. That's been around for as long as we can recognize there's been civilization. So there's something about this that some people are suggesting is it's actually hardwired into us. This is, has sort of evolved with us, or is really a part of us being whole and being well as, as human beings. Right, and, it, and it's different ways to experience it. I mean, it's different. And, and I, I, I was sharing before the show, you know, I was doing some research and I, I went and read William James and a variety of religious experiences. And I had read it before and I was looking at it again. And at the very end, you know, he was talking about and I looked it up, and he was talking about alcohol. And so I was ready to hear, you know, alcohol's bad and alcohol's oh, bad. Yeah. And he actually said the opposite. He says, you know, uh, alcohol in some ways gives you a taste of, of, um, of a well-being. Uh -huh. He says, you know, in the initial stage, you know, everything is good, everything is fine, so you feel good about yourself. A, a taste relief. for the divine. Huh? Yeah, and yeah. he says, like, yeah. it's a taste. And of course, later on, it becomes terrible. It's very yeah. destructive. But he says, in a way, I know this to be true. I mean, some of the folks I used to work with, they were so harmed in some ways and didn't feel good about themselves, didn't feel good about their lives. And when they did drugs or when they did alcohol, it was such a sense of relief. It was yeah. such a sense of like, um, they felt good about themselves. They mm -hmm. felt it was okay. It didn't matter what else was going on. You know, it was all right. And as long as they could do their drug, uh, life would be okay. Right, yeah. And, I got to say that when we take the drug away, we still want them to feel good about themselves. Yeah. We still want them to feel that life will be the way it is, and you have to sort of show up, and you know it, it's yeah. okay, and you're good enough. But at that point, their life's gotten worse. Oh yeah, from much when worse. When they initially start off, I remember we saw the movie Hungry Heart last week. Right. Uh, about about um, opiate addiction, mostly prescription addiction, up in Franklin County. And what jumped out at me when they were talking in the movie and then with the panel afterwards was the idea of there being a hole uh, that people felt like they just didn't have a sense of being happy, they didn't have a sense of being connected or belonging. And then once they started on the drugs, it was like, oh, this is it. You know, this is, this is what I've been missing. And they didn't know that they had this sort of aching in that hole until they took the drugs. Right. And felt a relief. And I think, you know, and, and, and I think part of what spirituality does is it fills that hole. I mean, quite frankly, I really, you know, I really believe that. And, and it doesn't have to. I have a good friend of mine who talks about a, a horizontal spirituality. And she said, you know, I don't believe in the you know, vertical one, but I do believe that there is something that we all share. And there is something that we share when we're with people, the fellowship, if you will, or when we're connected in people in, in uh, meditation, or people who are connected in, in uh, rituals, um, whether it be mass or whatever it might be, something that they do together. And, and James made this point re repeatedly, but especially at the end of the book, he said, the importance is to believe in something larger than self. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. larger than self. And I think in, I would have added, it, and it's benevolent. 
You know what I mean? It, it's not a, a negative larger than self. It's, right. it's not evil. It's something that's larger than self that will help you. And, um, you know, as we got ready to do this show, we talked about how we're going to do it and what's a fair way. And, and I'm really going to put you on the spot. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. right. But what I would like you to do is explain it from a biology, from science. Sure, because sure. I think it's worth saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's sort of worth understanding that there is a biology to this. There is a chemical part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right, it's, it's, it, but I want to sort of start off with, yeah. uh, with, with the warning that a lot of times people think that when you sort of break things down to the science, whether it's sort of biochemicals or, or you know, anthropology or social interactions, that that actually takes away some of the magic of it. It mm -hmm. takes away some of that wonder and, and makes it rather stale and boring. And that's not the way that most people take it. Um, it's certainly not the way, again, referring to Einstein, that's not the way that he referred to it. And I think that most scientists who do this sort of thing, it even sort of increases their awe at just how sort of mystical and amazing this is. Um, so that's, uh, that's my, my, my sort of uh, right. warning, ahead of my, my, my for quest for, for my quest, my request for forgiveness before I, I lost on to this. Yeah, but, um, you know, one, I was fascinated by a book that actually, uh, the title was The God Gene by mm -hmm. Guy Dean Hammer, who's a genetics researcher with the National Institutes of, of Health. And based on how this has always been a facet of civilization, it always seems to have been a facet of, of being human, he started to think, well, maybe this is part of our genetic makeup that you know, maybe we could isolate a gene or a set of genes and then sort of measure how this, this plays itself out and f determine that maybe there's a survival benefit here for a species. And, is able, and one of the measures that he uses is something called the transcendence scale. So you've mentioned that feeling a sense of something bigger than ourselves. And so that's exactly what he was talking about. That's, you know, transcendence is a term that showed up in many different places that I was reading before this program which is that sense of something bigger than yourselves or a oneness with nature. And so he looked at that as sort of a basis for sort of a spiritual sense and that might be sort of part of how we're, that might be hardwired into us, that we have that, uh, that sense of that. And then looking at sort of ideas about uh, you know, evolution and how we've sort of evolved to, to be the types of you know, species that we are now, one of the things is that's common across every, every you know, mammals or, or reptiles is one, you have to survive and you have to reproduce. So you don't sort of physical health and mental health have to remain intact, safety, eating, that sort of thing. And sort of finding a mate, protecting a mate, having offspring. One of, uh, but two other pieces with uh, humans is it has to be also sort of what's called uh, you know, uh, association with kin which, again, so if you look at the way genes are passed on, I care more about my kids than I do my grandchildren. I care more about my kids and grandchildren than I do my cousins because I share more with them. And there's also the idea then that we have to be, uh, we have to reciprocate with each other. So that means that you have to know that if you do a favor for me, I'm going to do that favor back for you, whether it's something as, as you know, like around being neighbors, or if we go back more primitively, you know, if you bring food, do I share my fire with you? And then we know that we can get along this balance and none of, neither one of us is going to take advantage of the other one. So there's these ways of sort of studying this that makes you think that spirituality is a big piece of this. Because it has to do with sort of an identity, a set of beliefs, uh, sort of a direction, a sense of something is larger than ourselves. So as I was reading, it seems that there are a lot of parallels here. With, with the spirituality, with sort of our, our own evolution, that make them seem like they really go together uh, quite naturally. And then people talk about uh, also sort of then you can get into sort of neurochemicals as well. A sense of love being uh, fostered by this oxytocin. It's when a mother and an infant gaze at each other, she's breastfeeding her newborn, there's a surge of oxytocin in both of them. You see this with teenagers as well, being more connected themselves with each other than they are with their, with their families and with their parents. And as you look at a sense of, of mysticism, if you think, again, as, a, as maybe not the best example, but looking at uh, the effect of uh, psilocybin, which is an hallucinogen, or the effect of LSD, which is another, you know, better known hallucinogen, that these have great upsurges in serotonin. So there's this idea then, too, that our nervous system might actually uh, be, have evolved in such a way that we're prone to these sorts of feelings, the sort of connections with ourselves and with the larger sense. So 
and that plays a role in, in depression as well, you know, with uh, low serotonin, low dopamine, and low norepinephrine. So it's just it's intriguing that you can find these neurochemical sort of bases for depression and spirituality and anxiety that really speaks from a sort of scientific point of view, yeah. which doesn't sound quite as mystical, that there is, that, that these things belong together and part of us being healthy. I, and I got it, and that's why I asked that, that we talk about this on, on yeah. some level. I mean, recently I was reading a book called Normal, and it's a, a doctor who's involved with DSM-4, and now he's being critical of DSM-5, and we, I hope you get a chance to look at it. Yeah. But toward the end of the book, he gives some suggestions about what people should do, and he says, you know, you should eat right, you should sleep, you know, get your sleep in, you know, and uh, you know, don't make a big deal of it. It's just life, and we all have our struggles. You know, you had like, you know, and right in the middle of it, like in a paragraph, he goes, you know, and seek spiritual help or something. I mean, it was like yeah. three words, you know, and then he went on. He yeah, get, went on, you know. Get help from somebody else. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. you know, and, uh, and I think about that. I mean, it, it's, I think a lot of people recognize it. And, and I, I don't, I'm not one to put down religion. I know a lot of people, I mean, they're so easy to do that, but some of them are actually experts in spirituality. I mean, it's worth reading their books. It's, yeah. It is. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, and if you, if you were raised in a religion and, and you can use some of their practices, some of the rituals or, or some of the prayers that they use, um, I mean, go ahead by all means. But I, I, I find this a lot, that people sort of believe, like you say, yeah, I believe in God, but it's not part of my life. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, a, it, it, and, and I read somewhere where they talked about, you know, you can use God as a relief pitcher in the bottom of the ninth. You know what I mean? Like, you know, right, when, yeah. when all else fails, like, you know, you're in jail and you go, oh, God help me. You know? right, right. Or there are no atheists. <laughs> No, that expression, no atheists are in foxholes. Well, holes. whatever, you know, like, yeah. well, I, you know, everybody else has failed, so now let me try this yeah. God thing. Last you know? resort, yeah. But I think, you know, for some people, that belief is real. And what, what came across to me is that, you know, you want to develop a relationship. So if you, if you had a relationship, it would be different than saying, I only talk to this person when I'm in trouble. Uh, yeah, you know when yeah. you know when I'm in trouble, I call it. It's it's like, yeah. and that's really made a difference. It's made a difference in my life. I mean, but the idea is that it's always, it's an ongoing. And uh, you know, and uh, I, I understand now that what it means to be a seeker to sort mm -hmm. of try and figure this out. Well, what does this mean? Because I've always been interested, like with, you know, about with addiction and alcoholism and mental illness. Like you know, what's the missing piece? And I know a lot of times people want to tell me about the neurotransmitters and they want to tell me about the serotonin uptake. Yeah. And, and I, I get that. It doesn't fascinate no, you no, very well, I, does no, it? No, yeah. no, no. And I know if you take these pills and they increase that, you know, because I still think there's some, there's some element to being human that is, is not is not just there, it's not just in the brain. And I know like real smart people are like, feel sorry for me, but I mean, no, like I don't, I, I, I think yeah. there's more to it. Because some people try to argue that uh, <laughs> the, the mind is the brain, that there's so many neurons and possible combinations of firings that that's the mind and the brain are the same thing, it's nothing more than that. And then other people are like, no, there's, it's something more than the neurons firing. Yeah. There's something bigger here than just, just electricity. And even if it's silliness, I don't care. I mean, because it, it, it is very helpful. Um, you know, it's been become very real. So it's like, and again, I, I, I go back to my work at the, working in the hospital with alcoholics and addicts, you know. And it, it was almost like a challenge to them. Like, they're, they're not there to study theology. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, they had all of a sudden they were confronted with like, well, what does God mean? You know, or how do you understand God? You know, it's like, I don't understand God. Yeah, I don't like, you know, you know, how do I do this? Like, oh, I don't know. But it, it isn't so much like you have to be a PhD in theology. It's almost like you just have to believe in the possibility that you might get some help. It might be helpful to you. I mean, I think that, you know, and you run into this, and I know that people are looking for, um, like a lot of people look for alternative, they used to say anything but God. Right. In other words, I want what AA does, but I don't want the God piece, or I don't want, and I still think it works, because what happens is they end up with fellowship, they end up with a greater purpose, they end up with a, a different quality of life, if you will, and they try and live a certain way that's beneficial to themselves and others. I mean, that's true. There's, there's a sense of well-being. There's a sense of connectedness, a sense mm -hmm. of something larger than yourself. And you can see those things described in fellowship by AA. You can see that as part of church or different spiritual practice or, or whether it's just a part of, um, 
you know, mental health treatment, why that's helpful as well. I, I just want to make it a case for it that it's worth looking for. It, you know what I mean? It's like, please, you know what I mean? I, I understand, like, but if you're struggling in life, if you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction, don't shut the door to spirituality. Yeah. I mean, I really think that it, it, is, um, it, it is a way to end up feeling better about yourself. It yeah. is a way to sort of help yourself find your place. And, you know, whether it's Rastafarian, and I, I know that as soon as I say it, people yeah. smoke and pot, but I don't care. I mean, you know, and people tell me, well, the Indians did peyote and all that. I mean, yeah. yeah. But it was part of a tradition. Yeah. It's part of, and like, uh, I think Leslie Fishelman, who's a good friend of ours, talked about. Yeah. There's one thing to take these drugs as a shortcut to spirituality, because uh, it's not, it just doesn't last. Whereas if you practice, and like, like you were saying, not just sort of, I'm in need, I'm in danger, let me go to a, a religion or a spiritual tradition, but it has to be a practice that you over and over again, which implies consistent effort. And that's the way that people seem to find a different sort of a peace or strength in spirituality. Yeah. And I, occasionally, you know, there are people, I have a good friend that says he, he doesn't know whether or not he believes in God, but he believes in the grace of God, which is an interesting, you know, kind of sideline. But he believes that sometimes you can see the grace in people. You can see the way they're living. And it's almost a, a, for some people that it's a gift to see it when it happens. And it's a quality of, of life, it's a quality of themselves. And it, and it comes from, uh, well, William James said, and, and, and he, he referred to, William James, this is from a lecture in 1905, where he talked about the effect about how people change their lives. And he talked about the conversion effect. And the three things that were necessary was, one, there had to be a, a, a calamity had to happen. Something mm -hmm. overwhelming had to happen so that yeah, you know, someone just felt completely sure. defeated. Like a, a crisis. So and they yeah. said, I give up, I can't do this. And at that moment, they asked for help. And, and when those three things were present, you often had what the, he would call this conversion effect. And, uh, and it was really a way of sort of feeling better about themselves. It was really, it was, it was when they stopped thinking, I run the world, I don't need anybody else's help, I can be self-sufficient. And then when you hit this crisis and you realize, no, I can't, I need help. Yeah, yeah. And that's often when people appeal for it. But I think if you can work it into your daily life, you don't have to wait till the worst moment right. of your life. You can like, work mm -hmm. on it on a daily yeah, basis. You could be protected from this happening. Because I think what I see often is whether it's, it's the introduction of drugs and addiction, uh, whether it's mental illnesses such as you know, depression or anxiety, that seems to disconnect us from, from community, from family. And the spirituality could be a means of sort of bringing back that connectedness yeah. and that belonging. Uh, you know, we're coming to the end of the show, and I, I want to. I, I, yeah. I'm a little bit afraid that what I've done is alienate the people who are spiritual by doing such a poor job of it. And I've also made people who don't believe in it just think I'm just crazy. Well, you know, it's wasted a, time. It's an equal treatment, right? That's right. I, yeah. I, I might come away disliked by many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's really broad. They, they belong together. We certainly don't mean to offend anybody, right. but uh, you know, our, our wish would be well, to offer some kind of you know, help, a way of looking at things, sort of hoping to enrich people's lives with this idea that uh, spirituality could be a very big part of, of recovery and, and being well. And we, we had considered that you, know, you can talk about all the negatives about people with God and and religion yeah, and all yeah. the bad things about it. But I, I just assume not use this time yeah, to do yeah. that. And I, I, yeah. I recognize it and I respect it and I understand that it's out there, whether yeah. it's uh, sex crimes, pedophile, whether it, whatever it might yeah, be, yeah. whatever the or, problems might be. I'm not making light yeah, of it yeah. and I'm not making believe it doesn't exist. No, no, no. I'm just saying that there is an element to religion of spirituality. There's a part of life that should be acknowledged. And, and for a lot of people who suffer, that's something that yeah, could yeah. be useful. No, it's, it's, it's basically good, and we shouldn't let the, the small percentage that makes it bad okay. sway us. Thank yeah. you. So next week, we're going to have guests from the uh, Women's Freedom Center, and we're going to tackle the issue of uh, domestic violence and its impact on, on wellness and recovery. And, and it, believe me, it is something with alcoholism, yeah. when you look at it, and what damage it does to children. Um, if anybody has any comments or questions, please feel free to use uh, our Facebook or our website, whatever it is. Thank you all very much. Good night.